Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the return of Dr. William Lang from the other side. One of the most impressive cases I've come across relating to post-mortem survival. I'm very pleased and honored to have as my guest today Roy Stemmen, who began his journalistic career working for Psychic News in Great Britain back in 19. 59. Roy has been following the psychic and spiritual scene ever since. He's the author of many books, including Reincarnation, True Stories of Past Lives, Spirits and Spirit Worlds, Spirit Communication, One Soul, Many Lives, Mysteries of the Universe, Surgeon from Another World, which is what we'll be talking about today, Healers and Healing, and Medium Rare, The Psychic Life of Ina Twig. Roy is, of course, based in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Roy. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Jeff. It's my pleasure to we're going to be talking about one of the most fascinating cases in the entire history of spiritualism and uh, psychical research, To my, in my opinion, the mediumship of George Chapman. And as I recall, you met George a long time ago, back in the 1960s, and knew him pretty much continuously up until his death in 2006. That's correct. Yes, I was... Uh privileged to go to visit him um, to do a story about him. I was uh, uh, assistant editor on a spiritualist newspaper, and uh, he was working in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, uh, about an hour's drive uh, north of London. And I was asked to go and see him work. I'd read about him in the newspaper already. I knew his backstory. Uh, but I wanted to see him actually at work and uh, uh, was very privileged to, to do so. Let's talk about his backstory now for uh, the benefit of our viewers who probably haven't even heard of George Chapman at all. Yes, it's, it's a fascinating story because uh, basically he was uh, a, a young a uh, young guy, he was born in Liverpool, I should say. His, his mother died um, when he was quite young. His grandparents brought him up. Uh, I think they moved to Wales for a part of the time. Um, and then he, when he left school, he had a very basic schooling. He began looking for odd jobs, basically. So he became a butcher, a boxer. Uh, and a variety of other jobs as well, and pretty manual jobs. And then eventually he went into the uh, armed forces, he went into the uh, Royal Air Force, and was there uh, for some considerable time before transferring to RAF Halton in Aylesbury, which was where he met his wife, Margaret, and they set up home there. And uh, he then decided it was time to leave uh, the military and to get another job, and he became a fireman in Aylesbury. And I gather that's where he uh, began to develop some mediumship capabilities. That's right. Uh, one of the things he used to joke about it, he said they, they didn't have many fires in Aylesbury or emergencies, so they, the firemen in the at the fire station had to find ways of amusing themselves in between uh, uh, emergency calls. And one of the ways that they did that was to, uh, one, of, one of the men in particular had an interest in the paranormal and in attempting to communicate with spirits. Uh, and so using a glass and alphabet, they used to 
while away the time by um, getting messages from the departed. So George himself began experimenting with, as, as you say, an alphabet and glass. It's equivalent to what we call a Ouija board. Absolutely, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, it, he, he had an, an interest in the afterlife having lost his daughter at a very early age, their, their first child. And so I think that was part of the motivation for him to agree to just learn a bit more about the possibility of life after death. Uh, and so after the experiments at the fire station, uh, he would go back home and he and Margaret would sometimes experiment and were quite amazed by the uh, messages that came through. Uh, one in particular was from his, uh, his mother. Um, and of course, one would argue, as people do, skeptics do, that uh, someone was pushing the glass and spelling out the messages. But uh, things developed after that um, quite quickly. And that ruled that out when George began going into trance and getting messages from different individuals. Um, and that was really the beginning of his mediumship. So there was a transition from working with the Ouija board in which I guess you're in your normal waking state to going into a trance and then in effect allowing your body to be controlled by a, another spiritual entity who speaks through you. Exactly, yes. Um, I, I, knew, I knew both George and his wife very well, uh, but I kick myself these days for never having sat down with Margaret and asked her what her reactions were, but she was clear, clearly quite um, prepared to accept the development of his mediumship, and she was a great support to him in those very early days when he eventually uh, found that uh, William Lane, a doctor, uh, or rather a surgeon, uh, was speaking through him and had told George uh, via Margaret that they had a mission to fulfill, which was one of healing the sick. Uh, he had passed on uh, some years before, uh, was a noted surgeon in London at the time of his uh, being in practice. And he wanted, having passed to the next world, to continue uh, that mission of helping people. And George was going to be the channel, the medium for that. And I understand it took uh, some time before George was able to actually identify William Lang as uh, a person who lived and died, as I recall, in 1937. Yes, there was a little, only a little bit of research at the beginning. I don't think it was the, the main uh, issue, but one of his colleagues, uh, ex-fireman, who joined, joined him uh, in experiments, decided to try and check whether there had been a William Lang uh, serving in London. Uh, Lang gave details of his medical career, where he'd worked, and uh, he'd been working. He was, he was, incidentally, an ophthalmic surgeon. So a hospital that nowadays is called the Moorfields Hospital in London, it had a different name while Lang was practicing there, uh, was the place where he worked, but he also moved to the Middlesex Hospital and practiced there as a general surgeon. And uh, the research they did confirmed that there had been somebody of that name working uh, in those hospitals at the time that he said. That was the beginning of a mediumistic partnership that basically lasted for 60 years, from 1946 to 2006. William Lang became the main control of, of George Chapman and operated as a, a spiritual healer through him. That's correct. Um, and what was really unique about George as a healer. There were many healers uh, then, as there are today. Most of them practiced laying on of hands. But George uh, acted, he went into trance to allow William Lane to take over his body. 
he would then uh, remain in trance for up to six hours, sometimes more, each day that he gave healing. And during the, the procession of patients that came in, and William Lane would perform spirit operations or psychic operations on their etheric bodies to produce results in their physical body. And I gather that for the first 10 years or so, George maintained his position with the fire department and did his mediumship and, and healing work on the side. Yes, I'm not sure how many years that was for, but certainly he he was able, he needed an income. Um, he didn't have uh, much income from healing. Uh, I think patients would have been charged a small amount. Uh, I know certainly he would have given healing to some people who were unable to afford uh, a consultation. Uh, so he continued as a fireman for a period of time and gave healing uh, in, in the spare time that he had available. These healings apparently attracted the attention of uh, people who were healed. And uh, early on, I, I gather, be, even before you met George Chapman, a couple of books had already been written about him. Yes, the one that caught the public's attention was a book called Healing Hands by Joe Bernard Hutton, who I met on a couple of occasions uh, with George. Um, he was uh, an interesting man wrote several books, including one on Buster Crabb, who was a diver that went missing whilst doing espionage work uh, on a Russian vessel, if I remember the story correctly. Um, but he had a lot of unusual contacts uh, in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. But nevertheless, uh, as a writer, he, he decided that the story of George Chapman ought to be recorded having himself gone that to see William Lang as a patient, uh, being quite skeptical, um, and yet when he was able to uh, uh, come, come out of the consulting room, I think there was an immediate improvement. And also he was able to see uh, a progressive improvement over a period of time, uh, resulting in, in a cure of the treatment he went for, which I think was a, an eye condition, if I remember correctly. And then he he was able to visit and talk to some of the patients that William Lang had treated. Um, and the book Healing Hands was published by W.H. Allen, and it got very good reviews. And nevertheless, uh, George was still working as a fireman and a healer uh, and needed uh, to really cope with a greater demand on his time. And, and wasn't there another book by Myron, I believe is the name, if I, if I recall correctly, a, uh, a dentist who, whose wife had a serious uh, dental problem that he couldn't address? That's correct. Myron was uh, 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 a, a dentist, a, a dental surgeon, whether his wife was one of his patients or not, I don't think that's revealed in the book. But the problem that she had after a dental treatment was that a uh, an upper molar, I think it was, was removed. And when it was taken out, it actually brought with it part of the roof of the mouth, leaving a hole. And so Myron had tried to resolve that in a series of treatments on his wife, and had not been able to do so. So it was a very unpleasant condition to have. Uh, and I can't remember how he heard about Chapman. It might have been through Healing Hands, uh, but he booked an appointment, went to see Lang and Chapman. Lang did uh, an operation on her, and to Myron's utter astonishment over the next few days, as he inspected the the condition of his wife's uh, the roof of her mouth, he watched as the hole just slowly mended of its own accord. Uh, and I believe he said that would not have been possible really without surgery of some sort, which he himself couldn't couldn't perform. So she was totally cured. He was so uh, impressed, he asked George if he could write about 
uh, his experience and a few other cases. And so uh, the story of William Lang was the little booklet that uh, was produced. And I think George published that himself. And Dr. Lang was performing these surgeries in effect by not, not even touching the physical body, but operating on what you would call the spirit body. That's right. Um, and I saw this for myself when I went to do my first interview with George at Ellsbury. Uh, I knew what to expect, but actually experiencing it is something different. Um, I have to confess that my first reaction was it was unnecessarily theatrical uh, because I'd seen healers, well-known healers, giving healing by laying on of hands and people got better. So I didn't see that there was a need for operations as such. Um, but Lang, that was the way Lang preferred to do healing. And he his argument was that by making adjustments to the etheric body of the patient, uh, that would then be mirrored in their physical body and there would be an improvement or hopefully a cure. So I went, I was, I can't remember how old I was, I was probably 19 years old at the time, uh, fit and healthy and robust, had nothing wrong with me that I could ask William Lane to treat. Um, but I asked if he would do a checkup on me, and he said, sure. Uh, and he asked me to lay down on the couch, um, which, which I did, and watched as he worked his way up from my feet, slowly examining. And as he went, he would do, hold out his hand and ask for something and click and do these funny things, which were, was quite bizarre, I have to say. Uh, and then when he got to my head, he said, ah, he said, you might have a problem in future life. He told me at that stage I was fit and healthy. He hadn't found anything wrong. And he said that I, there was a tendency for a possibility of a tear duct blocking in later life. And uh, he would operate on that to, so that I wouldn't have that problem, which he did. Uh, and I've never had that problem. Uh, but what was quite bizarre and uh, a strange coincidence, really, if it was a coincidence, was that both my mother and her elder sister had both had serious problems with tear ducts, both of which needed to go into hospital and have an operation to, in fact, remove the tear duct and have an artificial tear duct inserted. So... That was maybe a coincidence, but nevertheless, I'm still fit and healthy, and uh, it's not a problem I, that's affected me. Um, so, I, I, as far as I was concerned, he was uh, the real deal. Um, and I, once I got to speak to many other patients, uh, I realized just how astounding some of the uh, uh, healings were. I know that uh, the Psychic News publication for which you worked would report year after year after year on various miracle cures that uh, occurred as, as a result of uh, William Lang's healing. That's right. Uh, and when, whenever we had reports, we, I, I was usually, as assistant editor, I was usually the one that needed to talk to the patients concerned and get their full story. And some of them were absolutely astonishing in terms of um, having been told by the medical profession that there was nothing more that could be done for some of them. But William Lang uh, rose to the challenge and was able to, not always providing a cure, but he usually, uh, they benefited in, in various ways from, from the treatment uh, he had. Some uh, we heard about were also close to death when they went to visit William Lane. He couldn't always save them. He was often very honest about that and said, I'm afraid, you know, your, your time is uh, limited on earth, but I'll do my best to uh, make the passing as, as peaceful and uh, painless as possible. And that is what we heard in most cases, that they had 
uh, an easy transition from from this life to the next. Now, you knew George Chapman personally. You spent time with him socially, and you also had interactions with William Lang while George was in trance. Uh, can you describe the difference in these two personalities? I can. Um, I first heard William Lang's voice when I was waiting in the waiting room. I was I was the first person he was going to see that day before the the, the people that were waiting in, in the other waiting room would uh, be led in one by one. Um, and I heard this huge voice echoing around the, the consulting room saying a prayer. And this was his practice every day. He, before he began healing, he would say a prayer. Um, and then I was shown into the room. The room was pretty dark. It wasn't pitch black, but it was a, a, just a, a dim light. And uh, Lang explained that that facilitated the operations he would do on the etheric body. Um, so um, that was how, how he operated. Lang spoke in a very cultured voice. Uh, he had a, a very nice uh, bedside manner, I would say, when dealing with patients, often joked with them. Um, but it was like talking to a Victorian gentleman. Uh, he was clearly somebody that had lived uh, in an earlier age and still had the manners and the culture of that period. Um, I'm not saying that George Chapman didn't have those manners. He was a, he was a great guy. Um, but out of trance, he was a very ordinary person, loved a good laugh and enjoyed a drink and a meal, uh, was very sociable. Um, um, and they were like chalk and cheese, two different people altogether. Did George Chapman have a, a, a different accent? Oh, yes. George was... Um, he, as I say, he was he was brought up in Liverpool. He didn't have a thick Liverpudlian accent, but it was uh, a, a typical 20th century English accent, I would say, of, of that period. Um, he would sometimes stumble over a few words that he'd not come across before. Uh, he would never have claimed to have been highly educated, uh, but was very knowledgeable. Um, but Lang, on the other hand, um, had quite a vast vocabulary uh, and a great knowledge of the period of time when he was uh, uh, practicing on Earth. Uh, I, I got some feedback uh, from one of the people that I recommended go to, go to see him. Uh, he was a cartoonist, uh, Colin Earle, uh, who is now quite a well-known artist as well. Uh, Colin had a detached retina and he uh, went to see him in the hope that uh, it could be uh, repaired. I think it was the second time it had detached and the, uh, the medical profession were a bit cautious about doing another treatment. Um, and I remember him telling me that he was quite amazed that Lang, when he learned that Colin was a cartoonist, began talking about his favorite cartoonists from the late 18th century and 19th century that he he'd used to enjoy re seeing their work. And I think he knew one or two of them, which was quite amazing. Um, Colin uh, had a, 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 an operation from Lang on his eyes, and Lang said he'd like to see them in him in two weeks' time. So the next week... Uh, a companion had driven him all the way up to Ellsbury for a second treatment and a checkup to see that all was well. And to his surprise, Lang didn't mention anything about his eyes. Instead, he simply uh, prodded around the heart and said there was a problem and advised him that as soon as he got home, he should go to see his doctor and ask for it to be checked. Now, Colin was not happy with that at all. He came out, the companion had driven him to, to the surgery, 
he said, I, uh, we need to go and have a drink. He said, the man's a fraud. He's not even looked at my eyes. He's forgotten what he did or why I went there last time. And uh, they had a drink and he went home in a very bad mood uh, about this. Three days later, he had a heart attack and was rushed to hospital. I'm pleased to say that he did survive. Um, and looking back on that, he realizes now that uh, Lang obviously knew more than, uh, than he suspected at the time. Now, as a result of uh, the books that had been written, members of Lang's family uh, learned about this mediumship. And I, I gather, at least initially, they were rather skeptical that their deceased relative was uh, operating and performing surgeries through a spiritualist medium. Yes, and I think most people in that situation will be skeptical as well. Um, the good news is that in time they did go to find out for themselves. Um, the, the, the person that was most influential in, in uh, George Chapman's life was Lyndon Lang, who was the daughter of George, uh, of William Lang. She heard that a medium claiming to be the channel for her dead father was giving healing from two sisters who ran a, a healing circle in Birmingham. And they had invited uh, George to, uh, to give a treatment to some of their regular visitors. And he agreed. It so happens, and again, coincidence, I guess, um, that one of the sisters had known uh, of um, Lyndon Lang uh, because this woman's husband had served in France during the war and uh, Basil, uh, who was William Lang's uh, son, had also been serving out uh, in France at the time. And uh, a friendship had developed between uh, the, the husband of this, this lady uh, I think it was Mrs. Hanson, if I remember correctly, um, and Linda Lane. And unfortunately, the husband was killed during the war, but the two women stayed in touch. And so when one of them realized that the man she was inviting was the channel for the father of the friend she had made via her husband, um, she tipped off uh, Linda Lane and Lyndon was able to go um, and have a meeting with Chapman. I believe she was uh, intending to expose him as a fraud or had that in mind. Um, but, but I don't know that for sure. But certainly when she walked into the, the room and saw the entranced Chapman uh, and heard her father speaking to her, and talking about things that only he could have known, uh, she accepted him uh, as uh, exactly as he said, uh, the, the discarnate uh, spirit of her father. And not only that, but Lyndon Lang then became a, a huge support for George and his mediumship and the work that her father was continuing to do from the spirit world. I understand that Lyndon Lang arranged for George to hold regular seances with uh, members of the medical profession who had been colleagues of William Lang while he was alive. That's correct. In fact, because uh, having satisfied herself that he, that of the genuineness of the mediumship, she wanted to share that with others that, that knew him. Now, the people, the doctors that she was in contact with were mostly colleagues of her brother, who had also been a surgeon, and he and William Lang had worked together uh, quite often. And they so they had the same friends, if you like, but these were mostly younger uh, colleagues than, than, than William Lang. And they agreed to have a weekly session with George in London under a contract 
which uh, was set up to enable him to come down and do that. Now, sadly, there are no notes taken of what took place. Uh, they were private sessions. Uh, and none of them ever went on record about it. And I have some sympathy with that attitude and Lyndon Lang's attitude, which was that they didn't want the press coming around knocking on the door, making sensational stories about this, uh, and generally uh, not accepting it for what it was. They wanted it to be as uh, private and to benefit as many people as possible. I believe they often took a patient or two along to these sessions. Um, I did ask George once what, what happened at the sessions, and his reply simply was, I have no idea. He said, I just, get, I just turn up, go into trance. And then afterwards, we usually go to a club in, uh, in London and have, have a drink and chat about world affairs. So he was pretty well oblivious to what was, what was happening at those sessions. And as I recall, uh, because your offices were in London, he would often visit with you uh, after a meeting with these doctors. Yes, he did. Um, probably uh, once a fortnight, uh, at least once a month, he would pop in, depending on his other commitments. Uh, and we would sit uh, and have a, have a coffee uh, and chat about life and things generally. And he usually brought with him... Uh, something in a bag and he would get it out occasionally and say look what I was given today and it would usually be something like a clock or an ornament or uh, some some a box or something and they usually had inscriptions to William Lang from whoever it was and what I realized in later life it didn't make any sense to me at the time because I didn't know what he was doing in London he wasn't allowed to talk about it in any detail. But these were uh, colleagues of Lang that wanted his work to be honored and to pass to George any items that they felt he ought to have in recognition of the work he was doing with Lang. Um, and so as a result, uh, George collected together uh, quite a uh, a, a bizarre collection of objects and items and furniture. He didn't bring those into the office, but I've seen the furniture. Uh, he even slept in, in uh, William Lane's bed. <laughs> and, uh, and they are, he, he used to call them the Lane Museum and they are still in the possession of uh, George's family. Michael Chapman worked very closely with his father during the healing sessions and is also a healer to these days. He doesn't go into trance, he's a straightforward healing uh, by putting hands on patients. But Basil Lang, the son of William Lang, is the spirit that is credited with performing that healing through Michael. So what you have are uh, two fathers and two sons, each working together in a spiritual partnership that uh, is now uh, well into its seventh, eighth decade. Absolutely. Uh, George would have been 100 years old this year had he, had he lived that long. Um, um, and it is, to my knowledge, the longest serving uh, healing relationship um, with two generations of a family uh, connected with one family on, on the other side. Um, so, uh, like most people during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the traveling that Michael would do both around the UK and also elsewhere in the world um, had to be curtailed, but I know he's looking forward to uh, returning to that. And George himself, uh, accompanied very often by Michael, used to travel the world so that William Lang was able to give treatment to patients in many countries, including uh, the United States, uh, France, uh, other parts of Europe as well. So um, it, it, although he's seen as a, a, a British phenomenon, if you like, um, it was uh, a, a gift 
that he was very happy to share with other people uh, around the globe. As I recall from your book, uh, Lyndon Lang, as well as these other medical professionals who uh, were now holding regular seances with George, provided him with uh, the financial support that enabled him to leave his position at the fire department and establish a healing practice which eventually achieved uh, international repute, uh, certainly among the spiritualist community. That's right. Um, she felt that the that the healing w was so important that George ought to be able to do that in, and not have the worry of having to uh, bring up uh, a family uh, as well as his son Michael. He had a daughter, Alana, as well. And uh, th so they made some financial uh, arrangement with him although the contract the medical contract that they, he signed with them I believe was only one pound a week which wouldn't have traveled uh, wouldn't have covered his travel expenses even uh, but I know that they would have been uh, supporting him in other ways I think they certainly enable him to move from the smaller house in which he first began giving healing um, I'm not sure how he found room in an ordinary little domestic house to do that, but uh, but he did. He moved to a larger house in Ellsbury, which had a separate surgery at the side where patients could come and visit uh, with laying and be treated without needing to intrude into the domestic arrangements of the Chapman family. And then when Lyndon Lang died, she uh, bequeathed to George Chapman a uh, portion of her estate. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, she made a few bequests, and then I believe the rest of the estate went to George. Um, I've spoken to people in the past that have been quite skeptical about the, the, the George's mediumship uh, and the claims that, that Lyndon Lang um, supported it. For the simple reason that Lyndon Lang never publicly declared her acceptance of his mediumship. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, that was because she didn't want any press intrusion in her, in her life. Um, and I think she was right to do that. Um, but by leaving her possessions to, to, to George, it was a public declaration of her total support for his mediumship um, over over the years. So uh, for, for George, it, um, I don't know how much it came to. I, it would have been quite a few thousand, and I'm sure it helped him enormously um, in, in looking after his growing family uh, as well. But more than anything else, it meant to him that she, he had uh, that uh, confirmation that what he had been claiming all those years was supported by uh, Linda Lang, the daughter, and we, we later learned by other people in the family as well. You, um, as a journalist, uh, research this question to ascertain that uh, this uh, bequest actually happened. Oh, yes. Um, and that's something easy that anyone can do because you can apply for a copy of the will of anyone that's passed on, uh, which I did at, as soon as I heard about it. Uh, and I have that in my files, my voluminous files on George Chapman and William Lang, which include doctors' testimonies, and uh, patient testimonies as well. Uh, so yes, there is no, uh, there's no doubt about that uh, having happened. Um, what, what was I found fascinating about Linda Lang, who I never got to meet because she was she was a secret <laughs> as far as George was concerned until then, um, was that even within the family, the Lang family they didn't appear to share their own acceptance of his uh, spirit return, if you like. Um, so, for example, um, there is uh, a uh, Basil's 
the, the son, his first daughter, he died sadly before, I don't think he ever saw her, she, he, she was so young. Um, she gave an interview to Paris Match in uh, the French publication, declaring that she had also been to see William Lane, talked to him uh, about the past. He knew everything about her growing up and things that they said and did. Um, and she was totally uh, satisfied that it was exactly the man with the, that she could remember. Um, and with the mannerisms and the speech and, and everything else. Um, I, sadly, she died five months after giving that interview, but I was able to interview her husband and her daughter, so William Lane's granddaughter, both of whom had had sessions with George Chapman and uh, spoken to their dead relative and uh, were totally accepting of the fact that it was the, the person they, they, they remember. I seem to recall reading in your book that when uh, George Chapman established this larger surgery where he could practice that you mentioned in Aylesbury, that Lyndon Lang uh, wrote an inscription in the guest book. She did, yes. Um, and for that reason, the, the, the guest book was... Um, that they had two guest books, I think. They had a visitor's book, which everybody was invited to sign, and then there was a guest book for special people, um, and she was the very first one to write uh, a testimony to Lang being uh, her, her dead father and the, the confirmation of that. And then on the following pages, there are a host of other celebrities, um, including... Um, People, I suspect, from within the royal family, certainly Queen Anne of Romania, uh, European royalty, uh, was one of his uh, uh, patients and wrote a foreword to another book I wrote uh, before um, Surgeon from Another World, which is the one uh, that was published after Lyndon Lane died. But Extraordinary Encounters uh, uh, has the foreword by Queen Anne of Romania and as a host of, of its all case studies by often by very well known people. Your, your original book, as I recall, was published in 1978. Correct. And, and it has been kept in print for most of the time since, but we brought out a new version after George died. Um, he, before then, I should, jumping back in time, Lyndon Lang also left an envelope containing the names, a, a, a note containing the names of the doctors that had signed the contract with George Chapman and her uh, that he came to visit in London every week. Uh, she wanted those names to be put on record, but not to be opened until after her passing. And I was invited by George to, after Lyndon Lane died, to visit him. He was then living in Wales. I went to Wales to paint glass, and there were about four people who witnessed the opening of the, the letter. And we saw for the first time the names of the doctors that were part of that little group that had regular sessions uh, through with William Lane through George's mediumship. George decided, having, having opened the envelope, that he was worried that some of them might have children in the medical profession. It's quite, quite common for doctors and surgeons to have their children follow in their parents' footsteps. And so he said he would publish it, um, but at a later date. Um, sadly, he never did that. Uh, before he passed on. And so after his death, I said to Michael Chapman, um, you know, we were hoping that your dad would do that, but uh, what do you think? Shall we, shall we publish it? And he's, he wanted time to think about it. He was as cautious as his father. 
Uh, and then he came back to me and said, I think, I think it's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. So we published, we updated the book, uh, published a new um, uh, chapter or two about the doctors, naming them, uh, didn't pursue them in any way. They're there on record in the revised book. And there's a chapter about uh, Michael Chapman's healing continuing on from his father. And so that was published by White Crow Books uh, a couple of years back now. Michael Chapman, uh, continuing this work, uh, uses a different style of healing than George Chapman. He, he doesn't go into a deep trance, I understand. That's right. Um, he says that he sometimes feels the presence of Basil Lang in the room, but his, his way of healing is, is different. It's usually uh, placing his hands on the patient. Uh, he, I'm sure, gets perceptions about the conditions uh, and is guided to what needs to be done. But basically, I think he regards it just that he is the channel for the healing and Basil is the one that's doing the, the healing in the distance. And, and William Lang is probably there as well. I, I can hardly think, having spent 60 years uh, working through George Chapman's mediumship, uh, that he's taking taking it easy anymore. He's probably as keen as ever uh, to playing a role um, and helping helping Basil. Now, I believe early on in George Chapman's healing career, there was a controversy. It was all over the pages of Psychic News, uh, and Psychic News, incidentally, uh, now has archives at the University of Manitoba in Canada, so anybody can research this. I went there and, and typed in the name George Chapman and saw that there were more than 50 articles uh, about him that are... Uh, available uh, publicly in the archives, but uh, the controversy involved Harry Edwards, who I believe is universally regarded as the greatest spiritual healer in the United Kingdom. Yes, that's right. Um, it's an interesting one because uh, I, I saw Edwards on many occasions. In fact, Edwards, Harry Edwards once did a healing on a lady with a severe uh, spinal problem. She was unable to bend down and touch her toes. There was a lot of pain. And I, this was in his healing sanctuary in Burroughs Lee in uh, Surrey. And I, I'd gone there just to sit in as an observer and watch him do the healing. And at this point, when the lady sat down in front of him with her back to him, he was sitting side on. He called, he said, Roy, come over and sit, sit here next to me. And he pulled up a stool. And then he said, put your hand on this lady's back. And he positioned it on her spine. And then he put his hand over the top of mine. And, and then we were sat there very quietly. And then he said to the, the lady, what do you feel? And she said, I can feel an intense heat. It's really hot. And he said to, and he laughed, and he said to me, what do you feel? I said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, and he said, that's because you're not getting the healing. She is. And then he said, okay. We both took our hands away. He told her to stand up. He said, can you feel any pain now? And she said, no. And he said, touch your toes, and she bent down and touched her toes. So I am totally accepting that people like Harry Edwards could do healing just by placing hands on people, which is what uh, George Chapman's uh, son uh, Michael is doing. But William Lang argued that uh, he wanted to, to actually perform healing on the etheric body and he felt that that could be a more effective way of of doing it but he wasn't knocking other forms of healing but it was just the way he liked to do it harry edwards on the other hand began to take issue with this because i think he felt 
It could be that, uh, that George Chapman and William Lane were getting such uh, rave reviews, if you like, for the way they were doing uh, healing, that people may have been thinking, I'm not going to that healer. They just put hands on. They don't do any, they don't do operations or whatever. So for whatever reason he, he did, that, he began uh, uh, writing about this. He just said it was totally unnecessary. It was even unnecessary to go into trance. He felt you just had to attune to the spirit that was helping you. George answered that in the columns of uh, Psychic News and all sorts of other people got involved as well. Um, and I could see where they were both coming from because, I, as I said earlier, when I first saw uh, William Lane doing healing on me, it seemed very theatrical and, uh, and unnecessary. Uh, that was my thinking at the time. But the results uh, were impressive. Um, and the truth of the matter is that there are healers over the, over the years, over the decades, that, that have their own techniques and their own ways of working. And I don't think we can go one way or the other and say this is right and, and this is wrong. What I can tell you, and I, it's not largely known, is that one of Lane's godchildren, a man called Stenning, when he read about George Chapman's mediumship, um, wrote a letter to the Yorkshire Post and said, this is absurd. This man claiming to be channeling my uh, godfather, I think it was, not godfather, stepfather, um, uh, you know, I challenge him to prove it and blah, blah, blah. So the Yorkshire Post posted that without contacting Chapman, but Chapman got to hear about it and he wrote a letter to the newspaper and said, um, you know, I'd be more than happy for Mr. Stenning to come visit me, talk to Dr. Lang. I'm sure Dr. Lang will be able to give him all the evidence he needs that he is who he says he is. I only make one condition, and that is that he publishes his findings in the Yorkshire Post, whether it's in favour or whether it's negative, I don't mind which, but that he doesn't keep it to himself. George never heard from Stenning anymore. The newspaper never uh, returned to it. But interestingly, uh, Harry Edwards wrote to Psychic News and drew attention to the fact that Stenning had actually refused to rise to, the, to George Chapman's challenge. So I think Harry Edwards was a much greater supporter of George Chapman and his mediumship than that little controversy uh, in, in the pages of Psychic News would indicate. Well, the reason I bring it up at all is because uh, I was amazed to discover that the Society for Psychical Research in England, uh, which has been active for 140 years and very interested in the, the question of survival after death, seemed to almost entirely ignore the George Chapman case. And uh, yet, the spiritualist community was scrutinizing him intensively. That's absolutely right. Um, I was hoping that when, uh, when my book uh, was published uh, the first time around, um, that it would be reviewed in, in the SBR journal. I should say, incidentally, that I've been a member of the Society for Psycho Research for many years. I wasn't at the time I, I was uh, writing uh, George's book. Uh, the book did get into the library. Um, but the problem with the Society for Psychical Research is that it's, it's up to the, it doesn't have a corporate view of anything. It's up to the members uh, and researchers that belong to it to, to make up their own mind who they investigate and who they don't. Uh, they don't dictate. Um, and it just so happens that at that time, despite the amazing opportunity that was available to them, most of them preferred to be spending their time doing other, other research. Um, uh, and it's a shame. I, I know that uh, one particular well-known um, researcher 
had complained to the society that it wasn't doing an investigation, um, but it didn't happen, sadly. You're referring, I think, to Eric Dingwall, who at one time, I think, was the research officer for the society, uh, a longtime member of the society, uh, generally known for his skepticism. And in 1966, as I recall, he wrote a review of Hutton's book, uh, The Healing Hands book, in which he literally pleaded, we must research this man and look into this opportunity before it is too late. He wrote, but uh, sadly, nothing happened. To my knowledge, there were no real follow-ups to speak of. No, uh, which begs the question why he didn't do that. Uh, he was a, a well-known researcher. He also was a member of the Survival Joint Research Committee, uh, which had the special focus on looking for evidence for survival of death. Um, but... Uh, and I know that George Chapman would have cooperated very happily with any research project, but uh, it didn't happen. So it would seem as if, at least in terms of uh, where we are today, you are the foremost authority and uh, leading researcher as a journalist of this particular uh, episode in the history of spiritualism. Yes, I'm pleased to say that I've shared that knowledge with lots of other people, so it's pretty widely known within spiritualist circles. Um, but I was privileged to have a, such a long association with George um, and, and, and still do with Michael. In fact, I was talking to Michael just yesterday um, about the current situation and asking him about where he and his father had been in America when they visited and he mentioned some celebrities that they'd seen and uh, uh, sadly some of the names will be forgotten by today's uh, or not even recognized but by today's generation um, but uh, yes uh, I don't know of anyone else that's had such a long association and I'm as eager as ever to continue publicizing it and making more people uh, aware of it. And I think there's still more that could be done. Um, uh, I would like to be able to explore with the families of some of the doctors who we name in the book, um, whether uh, their grandfather or uh, uh, uncle or whoever had ever talked about those experiences or whether it was just kept under wraps all the time. Well, uh, and that's, that's a, something I'm well prepared to do, uh, along with a, a range of other things. I was sort of, I, I was taken off into another angle, uh, as you might know, I read a book called The Big Book of Reincarnation. So my study after George had died um, has been looking at reincarnation cases. But George Chapman and Dr. Lane's uh, mediumship was so unique and so special that I will continue doing what I can to make people aware of it uh, for as long as I'm, I'm still around to do so. As I recall, at one point, uh, William Lang in trance was interviewed about his mediumship or his relationship as a, a controlling spirit in the mediumship of George Chapman. And he indicated that this was a very special relationship, a very rare relationship, and one that uh, was enabled because they had had connections in a previous lifetime. That's right, yes. Um, and that's, that's not unusual. I know a couple of trance mediums who also said that they had uh, an arrangement before being born uh, that they would channel the spirit that they had, a, had this discussion with in a past life. Um, <clears throat> the, the details of it and how it worked, it, I, I, I'm not sure uh, who... Uh, who uh, they were in in the past life, um, or whether they whether George and William Lang had had previous lives, uh, I suspect they did. Um, I had a, a fascinating conversation with William Lang. Uh, I probably had about six different 
sessions at time. They didn't last more than 10 minutes, but before he began a healing if uh, session, if I was visiting George, I would be invited to go in and talk to uh, William Lang um, just to pass the time of day, if you like. And he was also always very um, pleased to see me and chat. And I had a chance to ask him about reincarnation on one occasion. And I was very surprised to hear from him his view that spirits have the same sex throughout each incarnation, that the spirit is either male or female. Now, I have to say, I've seen lots of case studies that suggest that isn't the case, where people claim to have been male or female, the opposite sex in a past life. But I pass that on for what it's worth. That's, uh, William Lang was sure that uh, we, we should keep coming back as the same, uh, same, same sex. But yes, the, it was a, an, a, an arrangement, and I think this is why George was prepared to devote his life to it. And it can't have been easy going into trance six hours of, uh, at a time on several days uh, a week. Um, but he he believed very sincerely that that was he had an unwritten contract with William Lang to serve as his instrument uh, once once he was reborn as as George Chapman. So he did so, uh, and and I have to say he always struck me as being somebody that really enjoyed doing that work. He, it was it was a lot of fun. Now, you knew George Chapman for decades, and as well as his son, Michael, for decades. Uh, have you ever, during that time, had any reason to question their credibility? None at all. None at all. No. Um, I, there are people that go for healing that don't get a successful outcome, and they might then complain. Um, I mentioned my friend... Uh, the cartoonist that went up and he thought that uh, Lang was a fraud, but only for a couple of days and then he had a heart attack, uh, having not listened to what Lang had told him to do when he got back home. Um, no, um, there's, there's uh, I'm sure there would be plenty of skeptics around would have looked for good evidence of a scam, but, but uh, no, not at all. Um, there are not many mediums that I can say that about, um, because I think the whole question of mediumship has to be viewed very skeptically, and I think it's very easy for some mediums to uh, uh, allow their subconscious to interfere perhaps with what's happening. But uh, from what I saw uh, personally uh, and from talking to other people, I'm totally convinced that uh, when George was in trance, uh, there was somebody completely different that was in control of his his body and his speech and was able to do miracles at times. Well, Roy Stemmen, this has been a very inspiring conversation, uh, one of the most important cases I'm aware of in, in the whole history of parapsychology, psychical research, or spiritualism. And I'm very honored to have you on the New Thinking Aloud channel and to be able to share this story with our viewers. And I'm also happy to report that uh, we plan uh, to do future interviews because you've, you've been been researching this field and exploring it for over half a century. You have a wealth of knowledge. I'll be delighted to do that, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Well, Roy, thank you so much for being with me. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.